Um, now, uh, with your permission, if we can then move to to the very uh, last uh, last part of our uh, conference, and again, uh, I should and I, I want to join uh, uh, other speakers and moderators in uh, thanking uh, uh, to the Ministry of Justice and the Council of Europe for for organising. Uh, organizing this event. It, indeed, for me, and I hope for you as well, uh, for me it was a privilege and, and pleasure to, uh, uh, to be here. And I think if this final panel doesn't go fundamentally wrong, then uh, this conference should be remembered as a, as a great, uh, great success. Um, now, um, when, when you are a bit uncertain how to start your, uh, your short introduction, it's always safe, or sometimes it's safe to, to use a, a quotation. So um, I, chose, I chose this quotation for you this, this afternoon. Kitsch causes two tears to flow in quick succession. The first tear says, how, no, how nice to see children running on the grass. The second tier says, how nice to be moved together with all mankind by children running on the grass. And probably uh, you have recognized that this is a quotation from a quite famous novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being by, by Milan uh, Kundera. Of course, to be very clear, uh, I'm not trying to say here that our concern with migrant children in detention is kitsch. What I'm trying to convey to you is that our compassion and empathy with the fate of migrant children is not sufficient. We need to, we need to do more. And this is where I come to the topic of our conference. This is, this is the bridge I, I, I tried to build between the, the quotation, the quote, and topic of our conference, which is now to be, to be concluded with final remarks by, by our three panelists. As you know, the Czech chairmanship in the Committee of Ministers uh, of the Council of Europe has as one of its priorities the protection of vulnerable groups, including migrant children. And therefore, I'm very pleased that during this conference, we had a very thorough debate about alternative measures to detention, and hopefully we can all be inspired by many, of suggestion, by many suggestions and best practices which were introduced here. But it is not for me to draw conclusions from the proceedings of this conference, because, as I said, I have my learned colleagues to, to do so. so Without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor first to Tomáš Poček and then to Christos Jakamopoulos. But Tomáš, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Emil. Thank you all for these two days, so rich in discussions, in emotions, but above all, cogent arguments. When I opened this, the first plenary session and of the conference, I told you the stories of some of the children I met during my fact-finding missions as special representative of the Council of Europe Secretary General on Migration and Refugees. Yvonne in Lampedusa and Arman in, in Reske, one of the transit zones in, in Hungary. After these two days, I'm wondering whether we have achieved anything to change the situation of these children. How did this conference help them? Or did it help them at all? I choose to think that it did. Walking out of the Joffin Palace this evening, I believe that each one of us will have taken with him or her some very concrete ideas about the way forward. What are the next steps to be taken towards the overarching goal of ending the migration detention of children? I would say that we need action on the practical and on the political level. To start with the practical level, 
We need to look at the broader context within which the detention of migrant children happens, at different procedures that are linked to the decision to deprive members of a very vulnerable group of their liberty, procedures for providing migrant and refugee children with appropriate information on their legal status and their prospect for the future, procedures for conducting a proper age assessment, for making sure that guardians are appointed for unaccompanied minors, and for bringing about family reunification. If these other procedures work, many migrant and refugee children will not have to be detained at all. Then we will also have to work on the political level to convince policymakers that there are alternatives to the detention of migrant children and show them how these alternatives can be used. This is admittedly the more difficult part, but it is no one in this room will have any doubts worth trying. So what are the main arguments for alternatives to migrant detention of children? They are cheaper, and they are less dangerous than detention, less dangerous for, for the children themselves in terms of the harm that detention inevitably causes, and less dangerous in the long run for our societies. The message they deliver is about containing intolerance, about decreasing social tension, and ultimately about preserving the integrity and credibility of our institutions, our belief in human rights and the rule of law, our democratic values. So it looks like it's a win-win situation. But if the case for alternatives is that obvious, why are not they applied to migrant children as often as we would like them to be? Are there any fundamental object objections to them? Are these objections related to the fact that alternatives are also harmful for migrant children? Or to the fact that they are not as effective as detention in terms of preserving absconding, preventing absconding, sorry. These are arguments worth considering. In order to address the first argument, let us examine the circumstances in which alternatives are needed. Most asylum-seeking children, including those who will be reunified with their families under Dublin, would not have to be detained at all. So the question of alternatives wouldn't even arise. Unaccompanied minors are sometimes detained because the authorities consider that this is the only way of protecting them. This is certainly a case where we need to consider alternatives. And then you have children who have to be returned together with their families. Again, this is a situation where alternatives have to be considered for the children and their family. Returns are also a case where if alternatives are shown not to be a credible solution, very short periods of detention could be admissible. If we want to convince governments, we have to be realistic and pragmatic. But these periods have to be really very, very short. The decision-making process must be correct in the sense that the best interest of the child must be taken into account before the decision to detain the parents is taken. All alternatives must be considered and excluded. The conditions of detention must be in accordance with international standards. And there must be safeguards against abuse. And in, in this connection, I'm pleased to inform you that I have commissioned a study on the way that complaints mechanism against law enforcement can work in border situations. In the circumstances described above, I hope that you will agree with me that alternatives are less harmful than detention. Are they less effective? Not necessarily. We have been presented with different types of alternatives. Probably, we have to continue thinking whether we have a sufficiently wide range of, of such alternatives. But what is important is to focus on the principles that govern the process of selecting the most appropriate alternative in each case. You need proper case management, assessing the profile and needs of each individual child of, or family. You need to provide the child or family with all necessary information also on the consequences of absconding. And you need to choose the right alternative or rather 
combination of alternatives. To do all this, it is clear that you need the right professionals, not only lawyers, but, and I would say probably mainly also, psychologists and social workers. Most importantly, you need to approach this as a process of engagement rather than enforcement. Trust between those managing the process and the migrant child is essential. I think that with these arguments, we should in principle be able to overcome the inertia that has so far prevented alternatives to child immigration detention from being widely used. Easier said than done, skeptics might say. This is partly true. We are all aware that the road will be long. You need awareness raising. You need to work with media. You need legislation and capacity building in terms of money and training. You need a coordinated approach so as not to create incentives for secondary movements. That is to say, migrant children concentrating in the Council of Europe countries where alternatives are available. You also need the sharing of good practices. Most importantly, you need an alliance of actors that will push for change. Enlightened government leaders who will take the lead at European level, willing to invest in long-term solutions. Parliamentary campaigns like that of PACE, lawyers prepared to engage in strategic litigation before the European Court of Human Rights, who will know how to use the case law and the interplay between the Convention and the EU law. You need committed NGOs. You need to know how to place in critical processes like that engaged by the UN for the global compacts in which the UNHCR is one of the major driving forces. Most importantly, you need state officials, civil servants and advisors who will be convinced of the need for change themselves. And last but not least, you need fora where all interested actors can get together and agree on the way forward. When referring to all interested actors, I mean not only human rights defenders, but also law enforcement, senior policy makers and parliamentarians. People who do not necessarily share the same point of view. I think that the chair, Czech chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe has provided us with an excellent forum for these purposes by holding the high quality an impeccably organized conference we have all attended here yesterday and today. And I'm certainly prepared to play my own part as special representative of the Council of Europe Secretary General on Migration and Refugees to help bring the migration detention of children to a close. Getting there might not be as distant a goal as it may seem if we all work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomáš, for, for your uh, reflections, uh, also based upon your uh, extensive uh, experience from, uh, from the mission you, missions you accomplished, uh, from your visits to detention uh, facilities, and uh, I think you, you provided us all with a very reassuring uh, message and, and vision. And now I would uh, like to give the floor to Christos Giacomopoulos for his concluding remarks and observations. Dear Ambassador, dear Emil, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we come almost to the end of this um, exciting and thought-provoking conference. And I have the pleasure to share with uh, Thomas and, and Viet some thoughts in the form of conclusions, but not necessarily conclusions, of, um, of these exciting two days. And I would like to say from the outset that this was uh, an unusually um, challenging exercise. I mean, what I'm saying now. Because, uh, as you know, the conclusions of conferences are prepared in advance. Um, and therefore, um, what we do is that uh, as long as the conference goes on, we just confirm that what we have envisaged at the beginning 
is more or less confirmed. So we don't really look at new proposals that would deserve discussion and debate, but just confirm our previous positions. Now, this conference, I must admit, deprived me completely of all those good practices that uh, I have experienced as a civil servant in an international organization over more than 30 years. And uh, I was confronted continuously with new challenges, new arguments, new information that made me change my mind at least twice. Um, and I hope that this was the case for you too. So, I'm sure that all the interventions that you have heard to this during these two days, I will only refer to the one of Pinar, but all the interventions confirmed your determination to continue investing time and efforts in this topic, which is so central to our future. And so thanks to all of you, thanks to your contributions, I can say that challenge and determination is precisely what we felt and what we experienced in Prague over these um, two days. And uh, despite the fact that I am not supposed to do so, I would very warm-heartedly, and because it comes really from the heart, thank Minister Pelikan, of course, but also Vichorm. And I would like also warm-heartedly to thank Viktor Kundrak, Otto Hunemas, and uh, Peter Konupka, and uh, Eliska Hudisova for their invaluable cooperation, and also my colleagues from the Director General of Human Rights and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General of the Special Representative Secretary General on Migration. Now, let me come a little bit to this, to what we said. I mean, it is clear that migration detention of children is is a reality. I don't know whether we can say that it is still a reality, but it certainly is. Um, it is not forbidden by national law, well, whereas in many places I wouldn't say that it is foreseen either. And in international law, I think that the situation is very unclear. Um, but nonetheless, the my detention, migration detention of children has created an outcry in very various places, and I believe also in this room. And this is natural. Why is it natural? Because many of you might have read Tolstoy and the Resurrection, and you may perhaps remember that the hero of the novel visits a prison and is shocked by the fact that there are some 100 people who are there who haven't committed any crime, but were there without passport. And it is really shocking to find out today, more than a century after the Tsarist Russia, that we still have to deal with this problem in what we call a free world. So it is quite natural, I would say, that the Committee for the Rights of the Child, that the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, that the Commission for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, that the rapporteurs, the special rapporteurs of the United Nations on um, uh, the rights of migrants clearly take position against, against the, uh, the uh, migration detention of children. This is because since 1945, ladies and gentlemen, the image of kids in camps is unbearable in this part of the world. And this is precisely why PACE, the Parliamentary Assembly and the United Nations have launched the strategy against children detention for migrant reasons. Now, coming to the law, do we really face a vacuum? This is precisely where I have changed my mind on several occasions during this conference. Do we have incoherent standards? Do we have a conflict between national law and international law? Now, I would say no. And perhaps some of you will say that this is a very voluntaristic approach, but I think that this is the reality. And I will take 5.1.F, not only because I come from the convention system, but also because it is probably the only norm in international law 
that precisely deals with this issue and may be used as a basis for detention of migrants, including children. And now if you look at what the court is saying about that, you will see this is not the case. The court, the European Court of Human Rights, has never found so far that the children who are detained for migrant uh, reasons are detained in no, um, in a situation that would not breach the European Convention of Human Rights. More than that, in the recent cases which were referred to, in particular the cases against France, A, B, and others, the court moves away from considerations which have to do with precise conditions of detention, such as whether they are detained in police stations or in, uh, in prisons, or about the, 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 the specific conditions of detention, and looks into the best interests of the child and into the purpose. Best interests of the child, and we have heard here that there is no possibility that a detention is in the best interest of the child because it has a tremendous impact on, uh, on uh, it's a tremendous harmful impact on, um, on, on the children's personality. And this is also the position that the Committee for the Rights of the Child is taking. So, and what to say about the purpose, the purpose of the detention the purpose of the detention is, of course, to uh, prevent people from coming in illegally and to secure their removal. And there is a need under the court's case law to have a very strict link between the purpose and the detention. If the purpose is no longer pursued with due diligence, then this link disappears. And this would make the, the, the detention illegal Moreover, it will make it look a penalty and not a measure to secure something, to secure the purpose. And this is important because this is the link that the, between 51F and Article 31 of the Geneva Convention, which prohibits criminalization, I think penalization of um, asylum seekers. And I would say also the court adds the necessity. Not only these measures should be aim a specific purpose, but they should also be necessary. And if the same result can be achieved by other measures without detention, then the detention again would not be incompatible with a convention. So if you look very closely to what international law says, I would rather be in favor of saying that the space of detention, migrant detention for children is extremely narrow and almost close to nothing. And if you consider that these have to be even minimal standards and that in principle member states, states parties are expected to go even, to have to go beyond these minimal standards, then I don't really see what kind of migrant detention children for children is allowed. Now, on the face of this, we go for these considerations about uh, migrant detention for children is, as a general rule, uh, 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 should as a general rule be avoided, or that in principle is avoided, and there are some exceptions. But what are these exceptions? What are we talking about? What are these exceptions? What is the detention we are talking about, first of all? And this is a question that has been raised today. Practices in this field evolve very rapidly. What was considered to be uh, a an, an place where people would stay for some hours, finally uh, people stay in this place for some days, months sometimes. Um, what are the hotspots today in some of the places? The, you will see the CPT's um, uh, report that was issued today. Accommodation facilities they change depending on whether you have guards or not. And also vice versa, as we have heard about Netherlands, places which were supposed to be places of detention, they may become open centers and be regarded even as alternatives to some extent. I would say that we have three periods where we, we have potential detention upon arrival before the uh, removal, and these are extremely short uh, periods of detention 
uh, which could be for some hours or perhaps or some day. And then there is a part of detention which considers um, the detention pending determination of the legality of the presence of that person in the territory. And this is where we are, where the problem lies mainly. This is where the real problem is, because usually this kind of detention is extremely long, and it is justified by the fact that there is a registration process ongoing, or there is an application being considered. And sometimes we qualify this kind of detention as potential, potential removal detention, return detention, but this return detention may take 18 months. And this is where the problem lies. Or it may be protective detention. And you will, as uh, my compatriots have said on several occasions, and you will see perhaps again in the CPT's report the, um, the position the CPT takes as regards this protective detention. So this is where the real problem lies and the risk of absconding. I will come back to the risk of absconding. And this is where the alternatives come into play. Alternatives in the type that we have considered this morning, be they official alternatives or alternatives promoted by the civil society. We, we talked about alternatives, and Thomas Borchek insisted very much on alternatives. And I think that this is a key issue, despite some different views that we've heard this morning. Um, and I would like again to stress from the work that the, the CDDH, MIG, is, is, uh, is preparing, that none of the types of alternatives that we will pursue, or that the state will pursue, will be successful if we do not have a clear understanding and if there is an effort to understand the individual circumstances of each and every person, if you don't have children, in particular children who are well informed about what their rights are and what the prospects are, uh, if they do not have an access to a, an independent legal advice, and if you do not engage in order to create trust to the procedures, to the institutions, to the state where they are, and to, if you do not safeguard their dignity. It is not a matter of law, as Thomas said. It's a matter of commitment and it's a, of uh, cultural engagement. And this is not only necessary for detention, by the way, it is also necessary for uh, the integration of these people if their application is successful, or also for their successful return. So it is a very fundamental aspect of the whole uh, migration um, uh, process. Some stress that uh, detention is uh, only part it cannot be looked at it separately from the general migration policies. It is linked with uh, problems, general problems of migration, access to procedures, um, access to the territory, implementation of relocation, family reunification, lengthy, extremely lengthy bureaucratic procedures and lack of coordination. Yes, absolutely true. All these things taken together or isolated they put children in the, heads, in the hands of smugglers. I think this was absolutely clear. And this is what creates a vicious circle. We take measures to avoid absconding, and these measures lead to absconding because they put children in the hands of smugglers. Why is this so? I will give you some historic uh, information. In 2011, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe tried to launch a Council of Europe work plan or action plan to address what at the time was supposed to be a possible large-scale arrival of mixed migration flows in Council of Europe member states, 2011. If I may summarize what this was about in three words, it would be prepare, accelerate, coordinate. Now I must say, and I think if we frankly can look into this, the situation, we have, together with our member states, together with governments, with other international organizations, including the European Union, completely failed in this respect. Not only we did not prepare, accelerate and coordinate, but we have been extremely unprepared, extremely slow and messy. And this is the reality of the situation. And of course, when you have to take measures, in an emergency, in emergency, under stress. Of course, you will take 
measures that are not efficient, that are not well thought. And I think this is what led to this uh, migration crisis. Some would say reception crisis, because I think migration crisis would have had many more serious than that. This is a reception crisis because we were unprepared and messy. And the many, we took many, probably many inappropriate and inefficient measures, including detention and including detention of children, that increase rather than reduce trafficking and smuggling. Now, is this fatal? Is it too late to react? I think no. The response that we gave so far, however, you can qualify it as incoherent, inefficient, selfish, that all governments, all international organizations alike gave to this um, uh, reception crisis a response that has now reached a critical level of risk as regards respect for human rights and for rule of law. And I would even say democracy too, to the extent that democracy means not only the majoritarian rule, but also respect for institutions, separation of powers. I believe that this conference will signal the start of a reverse process, a reverse process that will seek to secure human rights, rule of law and democracy, and to reduce this unnecessary suffering for children and increase trust by everyone to our common values and institutions. And I think again that the Czech, I thank again the Czech Republic for having chosen this very timely and central topic for their chairmanship. And I would love to call this process that will start as from tomorrow, if at all possible, the Prague conference process in due course. But as Thomas Bocek said, we we have ways to get out of this uh, present stalemate. We have practical steps, and he referred to many practical steps, um, to support the efforts, efficient guardianship, speedy family reunification, age assessment, and all this is absolutely indispensable if we want to remove the question mark for the subtitle of this conference. A key issue is, of course, to reinforce also the domestic legal avenues and the domestic control because, uh, and I mean MPMs, Ombudsman, Judiciary, because I think, I believe that this, uh, their immediate effect, the immediate effect they produce is by far more effective than what we are capable of doing at the international level. Legislative process also, because we, we all said that alternatives need to be to be um, foreseen in, in domestic law. And I think Thomas gave clearly a series of arguments on how to push for this, how to fight administrative inertia, how to fight political indifference, perhaps more indifference than absence of political will. And in, of course, in this field, the impact of so, uh, civil society, the work of the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly, of the Special Representative, of the Commission for Human Rights, and of course of the CJ Dam and the DH Meek are fundamental, as fundamental as at least the Fundamental Rights Agency reports and the UN strategies. And I think on that part it is interesting to push that Europe should also look a little bit outside Europe to find examples of good practices. I think there are plenty of such examples. Now, I started by referring to the picture of a kid behind bars and behind barbed wires. And I think that this was unthinkable in this part of the world for many years. And it is, unfortunately, this picture is invading our lives and we might get used to it. And I think that this is precisely what we need to avoid. Detention, detention cannot be the rule. It cannot be the rule in the place of liberty and safety at least not in uh, societies that want to call themselves free and want to oppose themselves to obscurantism and fear. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christos, for your uh, concluding, concluding observations and, and thoughtful words and and also for putting uh, 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 the situation in a wider uh, context and also historical context, historical perspective. Um, 
I, I agree, I quite agree that it's, uh, it's, it's a very challenging task to actually present conclusions which reflect the actual proceedings of the, of the conference, but uh, at the same time I could hardly think of anyone who would be able to do so in a better way than yourself, so thank you again. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to someone who was courageous enough to come up and promote the topic of this conference, very important topic, but also sometimes perceived as a fairly controversial one, and who then was also able not only to come up with the idea, but to implement it and make, with his team, make this conference happen. Be charm. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, slowly but surely, we are heading towards the end of this conference. Indeed, this conference is coming to a close. What about the immigration detention of children? The contributions as well as the debates have been very rich, the theme chosen of greatest interest and, alas, quite topical in the present times. I should like to thank those who have spoken for their valuable and even invaluable input, but also all of us, for we have definitely created a positive atmosphere in which the ex exchange of thoughts could take place. <coughs> I hope you can share one of the moderator's opinion that this has been amongst the least boring conferences we have ever attended. The impact that this conference will have, however, depends on all of us. International bodies, in spite of certain understandable variations, as well as psychologists, tend to concur that detention of migrant children, be they accompanied or alone, in particular when it exceeds a couple of days, constitutes a harmful practice for minors whose best interest should be paramount in all decision making that regards them. States, visibly, do not have such a clear mind yet. It has been an expert conference, and we as experts have a role to play in this field. Simple solutions to complex problems do not necessarily work. They indeed more often don't than they do. Hence, it is up to us to find the correct answer to the question which appears in the name of this conference and to convince those who decide, that is, our political masters, of its rightness. I will not linger on that. You must feel tired, if not exhausted, after these two days of intensive, if not exhaustive, debates. And that is why I will quickly go on thanking those who besides the speakers and participants as a whole, truly deserve it. So, let me acknowledge the support provided by the Council of Europe, whose main protagonists have participated and often spoken at this conference. The help of the interpreters, of various professionals, of people from the Ministry of Justice, of students who volunteered, as well as of some other supporters of the Office of the Government Agent, has also been very important and deserves appreciation. Last but not least, both in official speeches and in the margins of this conference, I have heard many words of praise for its organization. That is why I now turn to my team. You have done a wonderful job. 
undoubtedly because the idea of this conference, of its theme, and of many aspects of its organization was yours. Your motivation has been the driving force of an efficient action before and during these two days. And it explains the success of this memorable event. And you have achieved that success with two helping hands of only one professional conference manager who has accompanied us since the last spring without any previous experience with the organization of a gathering of such magnitude. I mean, the conference manager has experience, but the office of the government agent hasn't. In brief, I am very proud of you and happy to congratulate you on that achievement. After all, and this is almost my very last word, it is for sure that our minister wished an expert conference during the Czech chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers. You transformed that wish into a reality which surpassed all legitimate expectations one might have had. And I finally thank the minister for having let my team excel and for it letting us all discuss various aspects of immigration detention of minors, which is a serious and reasonably controversial issue, even for an electoral campaign which has started in this country. Well, maybe as a summary, let us make the world a bit friendlier and less dangerous for kids. Have a safe trip back home where we, unlike many of these migrant children, luckily can return. It was a pleasure to meet you and to exchange ideas with you. But now it's time to say goodbye. I hereby declare the conference closed.